but there's no music as we would normally define it, yeah? Yeah. yeah? None at all. What was it that Cage was able to do? He did something that nobody had done before him by asking a very basic question. He asked himself, what is the basic baseline assumption of my industry? In this case, what is the basic <laughs> assumption of music and its sound? Yeah. I would put another word there. I would say it's intentional sound or sound made on purpose. Yeah. That's the more or less general definition that we've used for music for hundreds of years up until 1952. And John Cage said, why does music have to be about intentional sound? Why can it not be about environmental sound? Because that's where the music is in this piece, according to Cage. It's whatever you, as an individual in the audience, decides to pay attention to in terms of sound. So the fan from the projector, any buzz of lights, people shuffling their feet, that annoying person in the back row that always wants to unwrap a candy, you know, and thinks that they can do it without making sound. It's like a laser beam straight to the stage uh, that you can hear. That's where John Cage said the music was. And it was up to you as an audience. Now let's put that in more sort of business language. It's up to you as the consumer to create the music yourself. Yeah? So he, what he was able to do was question the basic assumption of his entire industry, then make a product that challenged that assumption, and here I am 59 years later still talking about it. Smith Corona wasn't able to do that. They made a basic assumption. First, that they were in the typewriter business. Second, I'll give them this, that they were in the word processing business. And third, that they were in the small business office product business. They were kind of getting there. So typewriter, word processing is slightly broader. Uh, small business machines is slightly broader again. But it's not the basic assumption of their business. Their business was actually about information communication technology. It just so happened that at the end of the 19th century, the end of the 1800s, and for a significant portion of the 20th century, that one of the most important tools of information <coughs> communication technology was the typewriter. But that changed in 1980. If they had been able to identify themselves as an information communication technology company, they would have had the space and the room to create. And that's more or less the first point of this lecture. That took me, what, 25 minutes to get to the first point? Broad definition of your reason for being. Your business, what I would call business rationale, what my other of my colleagues would call business rationale. But basically, your organizations, or you as a person, your reason for being, in a very broad, basic sense. John Cage was able to do that. His reason for being was to create sound experience. Not write music, but to create sounds that people would experience. Or create the context for people to experience sound. If he hadn't done that, he would have ended up just writing symphonies, piano sonatas, uh, guitar concertos, or whatever. But making the broad statement, I make it create experiences where people can experience sound, opens up the creative possibilities hugely. There is a company that is particularly good at this. Can anybody think of a company that is extraordinarily creative? You think of Apple. I'm thinking of Apple, yes. Now, what's the story of Apple? Apple starts with Steve Jobs and Wozniak back in the late 70s. They released the first PC in the early 80s, around 1980. They do quite well in the 1980s. The company grows pretty quickly because they are defined as a computer-making company, and computers are new, just like Smith Corona back in the end of the 19th century. Uh, what happened in the early 1990s to Steve Jobs, personally? Got fired. He got fired. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So he gets fired, <laughs> ironically enough, from the company that he started of an industry that he was one of the starters of as well, which makes it even more ironic. Uh, he goes off and he founds two other companies. Well, he founded Next, and then he bought Pixar, the 
animation movie thing mm -hmm. uh, from the film director Lucas, George Lucas, mm -hmm. and then he made that a great success. Then in the late 1990s, what happened at Apple? Steve, he got hired back because Apple bought Next, which was the company that he started. When Steve Jobs came back to Apple, was Apple doing fantastically well? No. Late 1990s, not a good time to work for Apple. <coughs> it was quite bad, actually. However, in the last 10 years, what's happened to Apple? Cool. I mean, this past summer, it actually became the most uh, valuable company on the planet, mm -hmm. albeit briefly. Uh, and it is ubiquitous. I mean, the Apple products, even if you're not an Apple person, you know all of their products. If you don't own any of them, you still know them. The iPod, the iPad, the Macs, the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, etc. You know them. What lies at the very basic foundational level of that success is that Steve Jobs was able to do exactly the same thing as John Cage. When Steve Jobs came back to Apple at the end of the 1990s, Apple was still defining its reason for being as making computers. Do we think of Apple as a computer company today? No. Steve Jobs said that is not actually our reason for being. Our reason for being is the creation of innovative consumer electronics. I would add another word to that. Beautifully innovative consumer electronics. I'm an Apple fan, so I'll, you know, I, I always think Apple should pay me a commission for their talk about it. Um, beautiful innovative consumer electronics. That gives them the broad space, just like John Cage, to innovate and create, opens up that creative ability. Does that all make sense? Yeah? Okay, so step number one is the defining of your business reason for being. And that means getting away from boxes. We are a typewriter company, we are a computer company, I am a composer who writes symphonies, to realizing that there are no boxes. Creativity is not about thinking outside the box, it's realizing that there are actually no boxes. Because all the boxes have been put there by our mental abstractions. And we can actually get rid of them all. So that Steve Jobs and Apple at the late 1990s, coming through the early 2000s, were not stuck in the Mac box because they were able to go reinvent the music industry with the iPod and iTunes. And eventually reinvent the tablet PC market with the iPad and so on. So that's the how. Uh, yep. Steve Jobs has a, commence a commencement speech at Stanford, Stanford and he yes. says about the typewriting uh, fonts and how he used his calligraphy course to apply it to, compu to yeah. Apple. Steve, that, that's another thing. That, that's actually also another lecture. Uh, Steve Jobs is a fantastic example of somebody who also learned from broadly defined the arts and was able to use that knowledge, those experiences, to create an unbelievably successful corporation. <coughs> the calligraphy, he took a calligraphy class in uh, university. He actually wasn't officially a student, I don't think, at the time, but he took a calligraphy course. Uh, he loved it. It was completely useless for him at the time, but when they designed the first computer, they actually put in these beautiful fonts. Yeah? And in that commencement address, he makes, it, makes quite an interesting joke. He said, so you know, they designed this beautiful new computer, uh, with these w this wonderful typography of s letter spacings and so on. And then he said, and Microsoft just copied the, ma the Apple anyway, so they invented the, the whole industry of typefaces and so on. He also founded Pixar, or bought Pixar from George Lucas, the animation company, spends s eight or nine years with Pixar, which is an arts-based organization. I mean, they make films. Yeah? And then he goes back into Apple after having all those experiences. And look at the beautiful products that he creates with Apple in the last 10 or 11 years. Uh, of course, unfortunately, he uh, died last week or the week before. What I'm suggesting to you sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Finding the basic reason for being. What is your basic assumption? Opening that space up. That sounds like obvious. I want you to try it. Here's a pen, a very common everyday object most of us use at least once a day. 
I want you to spend 90 seconds and see if you can come up with 20 different uses for the pen. I want to see if you can use your imaginative skill to question the basic assumption of what a pen is, which is to write, to come up with 20 different ideas of how to use it. Is that okay? Okay. 90 seconds starts now. Children are much better at this than, than adults are because we're stuck in our boxes. We can't get our imaginative skill <coughs> to work, to transcend the traditional or the contemporary, <laughs> our box, to create something meaningful and new for tomorrow. Give me some ideas of what you can do with a pen other than write. What other uses could you come up with? Any? Pointer. Pointer, yeah. Fuel. Hmm? Fuel. Fuel. To put it on fire and light. Oh, to oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Chinese Burn it. Yeah. Chinese. Did you say kill? <laughs> yeah, weapon. I mean, that was one of my comments, but not in the right environment to to think about multiple uses because if you're forced to think creatively about how to you know, you're in terms of the design that you just that pen. Yeah. Then you would be forced to be more creative. That's true. Mm -hmm. Necessity often okay. improves creativity. Yeah. Forces you to be creative. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, it doesn't you could die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a choice. <laughs> 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 you can kill yourself. Uh, so I got a pointer Fire, chopsticks, weapon, fork. Other ideas? Hmm? Massage? Yeah. Good. If I were an electrician, I would use it to see if on the cable there is still uh, electricity. It's a way of it's a two, 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 <laughs> If you push one, you get a Maybe. pen. If you push two, you yeah, get yeah, a pen. Yeah, in when you cannot breathe, you put it in your neck and you yeah. can. A tracheotomy yeah. device. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A thermometer. <laughs> Somebody said jewelry as well. Yeah. yeah. A stroke. Other ideas? Well, artwork. Artwork, yeah. <coughs> straw, somebody said over here, I think. Yeah, straw. Game object. Hairpin, yeah. Game object. Game object, often used as like a spinner, yeah. Music device. <laughs> music device, yeah. <laughs> or tapping, or, yeah. Lots of musical stuff. Any other ideas? Bubbles, yeah. Mm -hmm. Toy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A support structure. We could use a couple of pens and prop something up. Yeah. Scratching, digging. Yeah. In fact, the pen is used for a lot of extra pen communicative, communicative activities. <laughs> branding. branding yeah. You probably all got an IDC pen mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. to use for branding. What? Seaman. Seaman, yeah. Um, the Central Eastern European Management Association have pens as well. Um, what about my social status? And mm -hmm. how many people, yeah. be honest, how many people in this room have a Mont Blanc pen? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, <fine. laughs> the only reason for spending hundreds or thousands of euros on a pen is so that you can say, look, I have a Mont Blanc pen, it's about my social status. Yeah. The different use of the pen. For right. Yeah, it's but it's still a pen. Personal and it's personal brand. Yeah, but it's still a pen. But it's still a pen. But, I but you don't write with it. You don't write with it. <laughs> Unless you have an exceptionally large bank account. Like you're uh, on the top of yeah. the pyramid. And pretend to write one. Like <laughs> yeah. It's like a pen. Yeah, exactly. So, there are a couple of things I want you to get, get from this, this exercise. Uh, one is that if you happen to be in the pen making business, you need to be doing this activity because I don't think in 20 years we're going to be using pens. Yeah. Or paper. Or paper. <coughs> uh, at least not in traditional ways. So, like Smith Corona, if your business was based upon pen manufacturing, mm -hmm. you've got a serious problem coming up. So this is why you need to get this basic, what is the reason we are here? And again, this is sort of an information communication technology business. Uh, the second is, and this is the more important point, 
None of you were able to come up with 20 in 90 seconds. But collectively, we could come up with far more than 20. Were any of you surprised by some of the ideas of other people? Right? Like, oh, I didn't think about that. Why didn't I think about that? Creativity is optimized by the number of people that are involved in the creative process, to an extent. Okay? By making brainstorm sessions like this. Yeah. And other things. So, what are organizations actually made out of? What constitutes an organization? Procedures. <laughs> procedures. <laughs> procedures. Well, we... Uh, more basic than procedures or managers. Well, who, what are managers? Yeah. Individuals yeah. or people. An organization is people. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Basically, an organization is a bunch of people who come together somehow, either in the same space or through some communication technology, to do something. To make a product, to make a service, to deliver a product, to deliver a service. Something. That's what an organization is. The more people you have involved in a creative process, the more it gets optimized to a, an extent. Organizations already have people. Why are organizations not more creative? It's an interesting question. Organizations have lots of people. That's what constitutes an organization, yet organizations are not able to optimize the creativity of the people that work in them. So what are the obstacles? That gets me to this particular cartoon again. So the cartoon says, Creativity Corporation, a great name for a company. I would work for this company if it existed. Uh, and they pay me more money than I make now. <laughs> Actually, for me, enjoying my work is far more important than what I make. Uh, Creativity Corporation, the CEO says to this guy who I like to call Poindexter, says, you get back to that goddamn cubicle and start thinking outside the box. Pardon my language, <laughs> I'm just reading it off the screen. <laughs> Get back to that cubicle and start thinking outside the box. Now, I've already told you that creativity is not about thinking outside the box. It's about realizing that there are no boxes. Uh, secondly, he's sending him off to be creative by himself in a bureaucratic structure, cubicles. That's the obstacle. It's the structure, the limiting structure of an organization that kills creativity in the organization. You with me? Mm -hmm. Here are the elements, however, of a creative organization. Now it's looking more like a business lecture, yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a chart up there. <laughs> Arrows and stuff. Remember the introduction I talked about centralization, routinization, and value. What I mean by those. Centralization is the decision-making or goal-setting capacity of an organization. Who is it, or what group of people make the de key decisions or set the key goals, and how dictatorial or how absolutely controlled is that? That's what I mean by centralization. In terms of routinization, I mean the rules, and the procedures, and the processes, the everyday stuff, like you said, organizations are processes. The everyday stuff that people have to follow to do what it is they're supposed to do. Is that really rigorously controlled, where I start at step one, I go to step two, and then step three, and I end up at step 167, and then it's done? Or is there room for me to make sense myself, to figure it out, to move along? Does that make that clear? Goal setting, decision making, centralization. The processes of everyday work, routinization. Heavy or not so heavy, positive or negative. The third one is value. And by value, I'm referring to encouragement. How much does an organization show that it actually values creativity? And by that, I mean both the successful and the unsuccessful attempts. Apple was particularly unsuccessful several times. And it was Steve Jobs' fault at least two or three of those times. For example, they created, I don't know if you remember this, but I think it was in the, just the end of the 1990s, they tried a new iMac, and it was like a box, a cube. Yeah. yeah, and it didn't have a fan, or it didn't have a good fan. I don't think it had a fan at all. It used to overheat, and then the casing would crack. It was really bad for Apple. It was a product that failed. 
but it was a creative attempt and it was valued. They allowed somebody to make the failure. So when I talk about encouragement in companies or organizations, I'm talking about valuing both positive and negative attempts at creativity. If we move up a level, the first two are talking about relative autonomy, your freedom to do stuff. The bottom one is about encouragement, and all three, centralization, routinization, and value, combined as autonomy and encouragement are the elements of creative culture that I will refer to. And I'm going to put it in this nice little graph for you. So you've got on the x-axis, the routinization is it completely non-routine on the left, is it completely 100% every step along the way is planned and controlled, that's on the right. On the uh, y-axis, the centralization, at the very top of extreme centralization will be an autocratic dictatorship where the CEO or general manager or whoever controls every single decision and tells somebody exactly how it should be done. On the bottom would be a completely flat structure where nobody makes decisions or goals, sets goals. And then on the z-axis, the value, a highly valuing, creative valuing company or organization uh, would be towards us and then one that kills creativity and says do not dare come up with an idea that hasn't already been said in this place before will be on at the very back. It's been a while since I talked about a, partic but a, a, a musician or an artist, so here we go again. Creative organizations. This is where we're going to look at two organizations. The first is a jazz ensemble, Miles Davis's quintet that released an album called Kind of Blue, and then the second one will be The Virtual Choir. Does anybody, <coughs> anybody here a jazz fan? Yeah. yeah. People know Miles Davis here? Yes. Yes? Name somewhat familiar to some people. This is a particularly famous jazz album. In fact, it is the most famous jazz album ever released. This ja jazz album is the highest selling jazz album of all time. It was done in the late 50s. Uh, and it is also considered to be the 12th most influential music album, period, of any genre, classical, pop, rap, whatever. This is number 12 on the most influential or most important list, according to it was either Billboard or Rolling Stone. Suffice to say, this particular product was extraordinarily successful. I want to play for you just a little uh, excerpt from the album. Take a listen to it. See if you like it. Tap your foot, whatever. Uh, and then we'll, I'll tell you the story behind how this organization created this particular product. Isn't that cool? Feels like we should have a martini, <laughs> a cigar. We can do that after the lecture. Uh, this particular album is not only famous because it was so successful, but it is famous because it was a huge experiment. What would you expect if you were a musician? You're one of Miles Davis's musicians in his group, and you were going to record an album, what would you expect to record? How would you expect the process to go, generally speaking? You would show up at the recording studio at a certain time, you probably warm up, practice a little bit, and then you would record, would you record songs and pieces that you've played many, many times, worked on, or would you record something you've never seen or heard before? Many, many times or something you've never seen before? Many, 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 many times. That's how musicians work. I've done a couple of recordings in Canada in my previous life as a professional pianist. <laughs> uh, and I would not dare put anything on mm. CD or for radio that I had not seen before. Never. Actually makes me feel uncomfortable just thinking about the idea. When Miles Davis's musicians showed up at the recording studio, Miles Davis comes in, you can imagine what they would say. So, Miles, you know, what are we recording today? Are we recording the, the, the tunes that we played last week at the Blue Note? Are we recording the stuff we did, you know, last uh, month at, in San Diego? You know, what are we recording? Miles Davis said, no, actually, I just wrote a couple of new tunes, and I came up with some very basic chord progressions, some new modes. Uh, you've not seen them before. You've never heard them before, but that's what we're going to record. I personally would have walked out <laughs> and said, you've got to be kidding me. I'm not putting this on at that time on a, on a uh, LP for posterity. It's going to exist forever, more or less. But they actually did it. And this is the result. And in fact, 
when you read the history of this, according to the, the musicians that were there, they all say that Miles Davis brought in these new tunes that had very basic chord progressions. There were actually only two or three chords per piece, uh, and explained some scales or modes that he thought would work with these um, particular tunes and these chords. Kind of showed them around, maybe played a couple of notes on his trumpet, maybe played a little bit on the piano. And then they turned on the recording equipment, and that's what they recorded. More or less first takes of everything. That's unbelievable for a an organization, a musical organization, to record in that manner. What can that tell us? Where would you put that kind of organization in terms of centralization, goal setting and decision making, and routinization of processes and procedures? Yeah? Would you put it minus minus? Let's take it one at a time. Let's think about centralization first. Definitely minus. You think minus. Who else thinks minus? Actually, one person decided that they will record something that could be never played before. There, yes. So there was some centralization of decision making. Miles Davis was the, the de facto leader of the group. I mean, it was called his his group. You find the Miles goal? Davis. He defined the goal. He's a dictator. Yeah. We'll do it like this. In a way, yes. <laughs> he made the decision, or he set the goal. So, for me, and since I'm the professor, I'm obviously right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever believe that. It was one of the most important things that I learned as a young, uh, younger professor, was that my professors were not always right. Because when I was on the other side of the desk, I realized, hmm. <laughs> anyway, I won't try to kill my own credibility anymore. <laughs> it's positive. There was centralization. However, did Miles Davis say, okay, here's uh, my goal. I want to create the most innovative uh, jazz album ever, and here's exactly how we're going to do it. We're going to do this tune, and we're going to play it in this way, and then I want that instrument to do that, and that instrument to do that, and that instrument to do that. Was it that controlled? every decision along the way? No. no. He set a broad goal of, cr of recording an album, and he gave the, the new stuff to do that with. So it was definitely positive, but I wouldn't say it was particularly positive, but on the plus side. Now, let's think about routinization, rules, procedures, processes. Was that extremely controlled, or was that extremely uncontrolled? Uncontrolled. So for routinization, it's definitely, again, on the minus side. Or in the, it is on the minus side, as opposed to the centralization. He gave them some instructions. Mm -hmm. They had sketched out tunes and some chords. But compared to, say, classical music, a Beethoven piano sonata, I'm trying to think of a Romanian composer, and I'm sorry, I'm struggling. <laughs> there you go, you know something. <laughs> Those guys, or girls, uh, although I suspect they're probably all guys. <laughs> That's another lecture too on music history, and I won't get that today. Um, which suggests, by the way, not that guys are any better than girls, but that girls just don't get any opportunities. <laughs> or at that period. <laughs> How did I get on this topic? <laughs> anyway, uh, in classical music, it's very, very, very controlled. You've got a score that shows you very specific notes, pitches, and very specific rhythms, and very specific louds and softs, and speeds, and so on and so forth. There is room for interpretation, but it's pretty, it's more towards the, at least the center in terms of regionalization. This is definitely very, 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 very negative in terms of regionalization. I have a different opinion uh -huh. on this one. <laughs> Go ahead. Because it can become a routine to be, to improvise in jazz, you know? I mean, they, this is what they are doing. Mm -hmm. It's certainly it's a their routine. I agree that, but I would s argue that it's a skill. Improvisation is a skill. Improvisation is not a synonym for creativity, but it's closely related to creativity, uh, and it's a skill. Similar yeah. It, well, how they do it is not necessarily the same time and time and time again. I have to really show the idea that the band was playing together for a long time, so I, I wouldn't believe that they just met and then played duty. They actually hadn't been playing together for all that long. 
and they all played with other ensembles as well. So this wasn't their their one gig, as it were. Okay, uh, but for example, the OMI that Jess is about improvisation, so this is a procedure, this is a rule that we all have to improvise. This is a rule what they have to do. Mm -hmm. This is not my idea. No. It's not. Yeah, but that, that, well that again is skills. <laughs> but jazz. Were, uh, jazz. Particular to that period, there were jam sessions everywhere. They would get along musicians from different bands, and they were doing Indeed, jazz but sessions. Indeed, but there is a mythology about jazz that you're all pulling on now, and that is that jazz musicians just jump onto a stage and improvise. That does sometimes happen. But actually, what jazz musicians do, they have a repertoire of tunes that they know. They call them heads. <laughs> and there are hundreds and actually thousands of them in books. And you learn them. You memorize the tunes. And you also memorize the chord progressions that go along with all of those tunes. That's where the routine is in improvisation. That you memorize tunes, and you memorize very specific chord progressions that fit an entire tune that would be, say, any 30 to 60 seconds long. And then you improvise on top of that. For the themes. On the themes, yes. yes. But this is not what they did. Miles Davis came in with some roughly sketched tunes that they'd never heard before, never seen before, and only two or three chords per s broadly sketched tune. So compared to what they normally do, it's very, very different in terms of the routines. Because they've never heard it, they've never seen it, it doesn't fit any of the standard chord progressions <coughs> they've ever used before, and they have to make sense of it all at one time. Right, so we can say that the domain guy did improvise and did came up with new things, but we can't say that the others were coming up with new things as well. Yeah. We could say that he alone was a genius who came up with, the, with something out of the routine, but the others were doing, doing just the routine. No, no, they, they were improvising just the same as he was during the whole session because they had to figure out what to play. And in fact, if you listen to it, you'll hear them making mistakes. I'll use the word mistakes. I don't mean mistakes in the sense of badness, but things that they tend to fix. At the beginning of this particular piece, uh, the saxes go, ba, 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 ba. And then they switch. The next time it's ba. Buh, buh, they changed the articulation because one person wanted to do yada all together, and then at the same time somebody else wanted to do da ba ba short, and the next time they do it, they actually find that that's the better idea, and then they take it with them. So it, it actually changes and morphs and em emerges as they go through the process, rather than having rehearsed tunes with specific extended chord progressions many many times before they actually go to perform. Oscar Peterson, the famous uh, Canadian jazz pianist. Mm. We all think that he was improvising on the stage, and he was to an extent. But he rehearsed, practiced, wrote out his improvisations at home. There was some improvisation in the concert, for sure. <coughs> but he rehearsed and practiced tunes with chord progressions for hundreds of hours at home before he would ever go to the concert. Am I winning you over? Yes. We'll have an argument afterwards. <laughs> okay, so this is where I'm putting them. Some centralization. There's there's a decision, central decision or goal setting body, but the way that that goal is re is reached is not set out step by step by step in exactly second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour set. In this particular instance, I would argue that it's quite unroutinized. The Virtual Choir. This is a brand new global organization. Absolutely gorgeous, beautiful organization. Literally spans the globe. This is Eric Whitaker, and he's talking about this new organization in uh, a TED conference, the TED, you know, online where you get lots of interesting talks. So I'll actually let him describe what the Virtual Choir is and where it came from for you, rather than me trying to uh, summarize his words. And about a week later, a friend of mine came and said, listen, you've got to join choir. At the end of the semester, we're taking a trip to Mexico, all expenses paid, and the soprano section is just full of hot girls. 
this, uh, just to give you some sort of statistics about this, there were 185 voices in that particular performance. So 185 different people from around the world singing. Uh, that was the first iteration of Virtual Choir. Uh, so they call it Virtual Choir 1.0. Virtual Choir 2.0, which is a different piece of music, was released uh, not so long ago, and there were 2,000 people participated. So similar kind of thing, but 2,000 people. Uh, if you look at the people that subscribe to the Virtual Choir now, in terms of reading the blog and so on, there are 12,000 people. Uh, and they're pr planning Virtual Choir 3.0. So perhaps it'll be 12,000 people. 185, 2,000, 12,000 in about two years. That's pretty darn close to exponential growth <coughs> in the organization. Quite interesting. <coughs> now. There's some things I would draw out of what he said, uh, which I actually talk about when I'm talking about leadership, but I'd just to, to draw your attention to them. He said that his first experience of the organization that we call a choir was that it changed him from seeing in black and white to seeing in shocking technicolor. Do you see in shocking technicolor in your organization? Is your organization one that encourages people to see in shocking technicolor, to have that visceral, emotional, excited attitude towards work? If not, something to think about. Um, the second thing he talks about is the beauty of people coming together to be part of something bigger than themselves, which is essentially what organizations are about. Otherwise, we wouldn't need them. If we could do everything ourselves, we wouldn't need organizations. It's all about division of labor, as Emil Durkheim wrote at the end of the 19th century. But let's think about the creative organization that is the virtual choir. Now this one, I suspect, will be contentious. Because the last one was slightly contentious. And this one is far less obvious. Let's deal with the more obvious part. Centralization. Is there a specific central decision-making person? Or goal-setting person? Yes. The conductor. That's obvious. So we're definitely somewhere on the plus side of, uh, of centralization. Now, is it really high plus, or is it a little bit lower? What do conductors normally do? High. You think it's high? Do you no, think it's extremely high. controlled? Yeah. Not so high, because the everybody is singing at home without <laughs> seeing the, the visions of the, of the conductor. The conductor is pushing or pulling something there. Yeah. And so there's no rehearsal. There's no rehearsal. Uh, they easily work with the home. And the conductor did the audition for the... For the, the solo. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I should also say that there was 185 voices singing in that first video. How many videos do you think he received? Thousands. He received 185. Yeah. He used yeah. every single yeah. one that he received. Which I'll talk about when I get to value. It's definitely on the plus. I totally agree. It's definitely on the plus. But I tend to agree with you. There's no rehearsal. They rehearsed at home, but he wasn't controlling it. He <coughs> gave them an idea. He gave them a map, which we would call a score, to follow. And he gave them basic time, tempo. And he gave them some, uh, you know, the, the gestures of conducting that show bigger sounds, versus it's smaller sounds, but it's not interactive in the usual sense of conducting. I, as a conductor, if I'm working with a choir, rehearse with them for months, at least weeks, hours of rehearsal, moving from one measure to the next measure and then back because it wasn't quite how I wanted it, and then the next measure, getting that crescendo exactly how I wanted it. That extreme control is the normal peer view of conductors. It's not also all that dictatorial because conductors work very much interactively today at least with the people that they're working with. So I would definitely put it on the positive side of centralization and I would put it higher than I would Miles Davis but I wouldn't put it at the very top where I would put famous conductors like Arturo Toscanini or Wilhelm Furtwängler. Routinization. This is usually where it gets contentious. Do you think it's extreme routine or negative, extremely negative routine? 
like no routine at all. It's plus, but not necessarily plus. So you think it's plus? How many people would also agree that it's plus? A few, some of you are afraid to answer. How many people would think it's negative? Or, okay, so it's about 50-50. That's good. I said earlier that classical music would be more routine than jazz because of the existence of the score. That's actually not entirely true. Oh, come on. <laughs> this was already written by him. Written, right. How many recordings of the Beethoven piano sonatas exist, do you think? How big are the different disciplines? Depends on how closely you listen. <laughs> I'm not a professional player. <laughs> there are hundreds of recordings of the Beethoven piano so sonatas. The reason being because classical music is about the interpretation <coughs> of the composer's intention. Yeah, but you drew the same notes. In the same but not same at the same time, not at the same volume. There are an infinite number of shades of any. Hmm? The difference comes from the mistake. No, that's no, no, no. no, no, no. But this definitely a plus. It's not completely minus. It's not fully minus, definitely okay, not. Okay, but it's not a full plus because you can play your game. Yeah. But there were some rules. There were definitely rules, and there were definitely more rules than in the Miles Davis example. They had a score. They had specific notes, uh, and they had a specific um, rhythm, but, and more or less a specific tempo. So those are sort of the routines that are there. But how they realized them was not routine, because normally the conductor guides them through the learning process of exactly how that rhythm should go, exactly how that pitch should sound, because remember they're singing. But they were the uh, conductor for themselves. They were the conductor for themselves. But right. they did the so the routinization is given over right. to them. <laughs> it's a procedure that it's a procedure that dictates fewer procedures. <laughs> He allow what he does is, and this is the difference between extremely routine and not so routine. He gives them the empowerment to figure it out themselves. Just like Miles Davis gave his musicians the empowerment mm -hmm. to figure it out themselves with some help. Okay. So again here, I would actually put the routinization in the negative, but just there. So I would put it definitely higher in the centralization, but more very close to the center in terms of its routinization. If you take in consideration that the guy who was mixing everything together, he was putting the things in, into the right place, yeah. that it's more it's processing. <coughs> to, to an extent, no. there's some there definitely <coughs> ed audio editing that happens, yes. But he... It wasn't like... An editing studio that, for example, if I describe for you my own experiences of being in the recording studio, I go in and record a piece of piano music. I make a couple of mistakes here, like a play hit a wrong note or something just wasn't quite right. I do a retake. So eventually, for one piece, I'll have 25 takes of that one piece. Some of them complete, some of them little bits, and so on. I then go into the editing studio. Because of the recording equipment that was used to record those sounds, I then work with an audio engineer who splices all that stuff together, changes the tempo, alters the pitch because you've changed the tempo and so on. That's extreme process control. They couldn't do that with this audio because it's just webcam and your basic microphone on a laptop computer. So it doesn't have those capabilities. They certainly you know, made sure the video's lined up from the start to the end, but that level of audio engineering wasn't done. <coughs> It's not possible to have a result like that without a little bit of masterization. Well, he said they scrubbed the audio. They got rid yeah. of the external noises of a fan or whatever. Uh, and they rendered the videos so that they, they were downloaded onto this particular machine. Uh, and that they, uh, they removed then lined everything up from the start so that the sounds all made started they at the same the time. They videos, not only the uh, audios. Hmm? If they use the video, the process will be harder because you need to spin or adjust yeah. the pitch. If there's no pitch adjusting, I can't agree with you in some manner, but not. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let's, let's just go back for a second. And listen, actually, if I. Yeah. 
And about a week later, a friend of mine came and said, listen, little teddy bear sitting on the world. And lo and behold, nothing. And then as the videos started to come in, poor. Stephen Hansen from Sweden. Oh, here. Poor. Listen. This is Evangelina Etienne. The end syllable. X. Lux. She didn't do it the first time. She went, Lu, no X. Mm -hmm. The second time, she did it. Mm -hmm. He couldn't fix that. Uh -huh. That would have been part of the routine. He let it to her to figure out how to do it. She made a mistake. She didn't do it the first time. There was no X. And if you listen to the full recording, there are mistakes <laughs> in that kind of... Paul Walker from Dallas, so I had auditions and also by a uh, La Soprano solo. I love the little smile she does. It found me. And Scott Aggregate. It wasn't together. It, as a choral conductor, that drives me crazy. That it's not together. And that's something you would fix on a recording. That's something you would fix in rehearsal, which you didn't have. And it's something that, if you were putting it on CD, you would never allow to happen. But he couldn't fix it, because he had allowed them to figure out how to do it himself. He had given up the centralized routines to an extent that he would normally have had control over. Does that make sense? Am I getting you over to my side slightly? But I agree that it is still somewhat centralized. So putting it there, as opposed to where composers, conductors would normally be, would be somewhere over here, in the top right hand corner. He gives up some of the centralization, other than setting the goal, giving them the score, and he gives up some of the routines that he would normally have with the choir. Can we agree on that? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe something like it uh, was a little less than plus and more than minus. You don't have a yeah. scale to measure yeah. it. So you so put it here or there, the difference. Yeah. So if you put on a scale, five people give plus and ten people give minus, then you make it to the You could. Or to minus. Now, the last parameter after centralization and routinization is value. Are these individuals valuing positive or valuing uh, successful creative efforts as well as negative or unsuccessful creative efforts yeah. by what they do? The positive. Yeah. Successful. 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 Yeah. In both cases, it could have gone horribly wrong. Eric Whitaker could have got absolutely no videos. He could have gotten 200 that were terrible. He got 185 that were acceptable. Out of 185. So he used them all. Every single video he got, he used. Depends how you measure the best. How so? How so? If you compare what it was out with a, a, a normal uh, uh, music play by a, a professional choir, the value of this one will be on the negative side. Yeah, but we because that one is yeah. very high, professionally speaking measured by the quality of the music. Yeah, no, no, I, I think uh, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, are they valuing the creative efforts of the people? Okay. In, yeah. in this, yeah. this, Whether this they point, is the yeah. it's plus definitely. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same thing for the Miles Davis example. He just said, I trust you if you make mistakes, which there are on that recording. Even Miles Davis cacks some notes. He splits, you know, makes, he goes Bleh! a couple of times. And it's on the recording. Uh, it's this idea of valuing the creative effort. So that's definitely both very positive. Yeah. In most organizations, this is not the case. Most organizations, or many organizations, creative attempts, particularly the unsuccessful ones, mm -hmm. are punished. 
And that's more or less what I'm getting at with this idea of value. Don't punish unsuccessful creative attempts. Mm -hmm. If you punish them, people won't even try. Mm -hmm. They be lost. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So if we pull all of that together, the balance, <coughs> an organization that's optimized to harness the creativity of its employees, one, if we go back to my first point, is an organization that understands at the very basic level what that organization's reason for being is, vis-a-vis -vis our talk about Smith Corona and Apple. Two, one that has centralization to a degree of decision making or goal setting. There needs to be some goal for people to orient to, to try to achieve. And this is what all the studies show. Because most people would may say, well, as little centralization and as little routine as possible would be good for creativity. But in fact, it's not. Creative people or people that like to be creative or creativity in general is actually harnessed or optimized when we have something to attain that's set very specifically by a group of people or a specific individual. Uh, however, you want to be slightly on the negative side of routinization. People need to feel free to make their own way through certain processes. People need to feel empowered that their contribution is valued. That they are viewed by the organization as being smart enough, intelligent enough, to figure it out to an extent on their own. That combination optimizes creativity in an organization. Without that combination, creativity is absolutely not optimized. And you're lacking something. And eventually, may very well actually lose the organization. Because you won't be able to change, like Smith Corona. So the, th the creative organizational culture, thinking about the work of artistic organizations, and all the research that's been done on organizational culture that optimizes creativity, of which there is a substantial amount, suggests this. There needs to be a very uh, low, or not very low, but there has to be some low routinization in the organization. People have to feel some freedom to make sense of things themselves, to an extent. It's going to vary in terms of industry. I would prefer that the people working in a nuclear power plant <laughs> don't feel completely free to mess around with stuff. <laughs> However, I would feel more comfortable about somebody who's working in a nuclear power plant to feel free to notice things not going right because of some procedure that's not gone right and to say something about it and to tr attempt to fix it, to have that freedom. Uh, medium centralization. So there needs to be some sort of positive centralization. There has to be some goal setting person or body that gives something for people to orient to. And third, a high value of successful attempts. Successful attempts and unsuccessful attempts. A high value of creative attempts where you don't punish somebody because something they tried that was creative didn't work out. If that were the case in Apple, when the iMac Cube came out, Steve Jobs would have been punished and fired again, and we would never have had the iPod, the iPad, uh, or the new MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, and so on, because he would have been punished for doing it, which he was the first time. Android would be the leading one. Hmm? Android would be the leading one. Android would be the leading one, and I would be a very unhappy person. <laughs> I wouldn't know I was unhappy because I wouldn't know. So that is the, the, the formula, broadly speaking, for an organization to optimize its creative culture. First is the broad basic definition of what your reason for being is. You're not a typewriter company. You're not a word processing company. Smith Corona's case, you were an information communication technology company. In Apple's case, you're not a computer company. You're an innovative consumer electronics company. 
beautiful innovative consumer electronics company. And then having some centralization, medium centralization, a low routinization, but a high value for creative attackers. That's the winning formula. And I look forward to deba debating that formula with you over a coffee or water or something afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.